So would our teaching and learning be changed because of this COVID-19, right? Or it is changing, would it speed up? Or what would be the thing, what would be the strategies we should pay attention to in order to uh, adapt to this change? So if uh, you have any questions, you can actually post your questions through the meeting chat uh, 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 box, right? Uh, uh, when you post your questions, uh, please uh, indicate where you are from, your name, where you are from, and your question is to which panelists, right? Then I will select some of the questions. I, I think due to the time issue, we might not be able to cover all the questions. So uh, then I will select some of the uh, questions and then to ask on behalf of you uh, to the panelists. Okay, would that be all right? Okay. So uh, if it is okay, to all the participants, then uh, first of all, I would like to invite Professor uh, Ibrahim to share about uh, some of his uh, experience, how to uh, uh, tackle the challenges in this uh, 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 COVID pandemic of COVID-19 and MCO. Uh, Prof. Ibrahim, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera and very good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take first and foremost, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Utah for uh, inviting me to sort of share my my piece uh, in this uh, webinar session. Now, to quickly dive into the uh, the subject of the day, uh, talking about the experience we had, right? I think uh, a lot of well, I I say most university for a start, uh, kind of. Uh, was caught stand was caught standing, uh, in this case, it was because you know uh, although we see the incident from China is coming, uh, but we didn't expect that the uh, government would have moved uh, so soon. If the government made an announcement on this uh, MCO on the 16 March, and to be implemented on the 18 March, so that would only allow the university sort of a one day grace period to think about how they going how they going to move through. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, talking from UP experience, what we did was when we knew about the matters on the, on uh, the, when when we learned about the announcement on the 16th of March, we actually get an emergency Senate meeting on the 17th to actually look at what uh, are the steps to be taken. Now, when you look at uh, the the issues that need to be addressed, uh, among among others, it goes on looking at uh, how do you do your teaching and learning. Yeah, because suddenly you can't do it uh, as per normal practices, which is face to face. So this one thing, how do we continue to do the, our teaching and learning? And secondly, now, if we go and do our teaching and learning up to a certain period, now in the case of UTP, we are approaching towards the end of the semester. We then uh, have to think about how do we conduct the exams, the assessment of the student. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and what would be the method that would be acceptable? Because you're talking about do an online assessment. How do you ensure the integrity of the assessment remain intact? Yeah. Uh, and, and also, how do you sort of devise the kind of assessment that you need to do? <clears throat> and then on another part of it is that let's suppose if we were to roll on the whole lot of this, what do we need Yeah. Uh, to do this? And that's UTP has what it takes to actually do it. And on the other hand, does the student have what it takes to actually receive it? Yeah. So talking about accessibility uh, uh, of either on the on the bandwidth, uh, on the uh, uh, on the uh, on the internet connection, as well as on our system. So <clears throat> when we early on had the discussion we had uh, because government was, was initially announcing it only for a period of two weeks, uh, MCO, so we, didn't, we, we just say, okay, uh, in this case, since a lot of the students are leaving the, the university on uh, on the 17th, right, in preparation of the 18th March MCO, uh, what we can do is, period is only for two weeks, then we just settle for uh, sort of postponing the whole lot, because after two weeks, we can continue. Uh, but it doesn't go that way. The uh, MCO program then learn that government is not going to end the MCO by two weeks time. And so there was an instruction to go on online. Yeah. So when the instruction come on board, 
we sort of uh, see that coming uh, after a few days going through the MCO because then only we realize how serious uh, the the quarantine uh, situation is, and then we we start putting our team together and then look at how do we address all the requirements. Yeah, uh, I even had uh, connection and discussion across with my network, yeah, with my networking uh, of VCs uh, around, and and from there we work out some solutions. Now, um, when we look at it, first and foremost, uh, we found that what needs to be done is how do we that 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 how do we continue to do that teaching and learning yeah teaching and without having uh, the it system that we had yeah is where uh, we were quite fortunate in the sense that our it system that we put together have actually uh when we do some foresighting we were looking at somewhere along the line we need to adapt to this uh, this online teaching and learning as well as online learning. That's why we have put together uh, quite a number of systems uh, which allows us to do that, that teaching and learning online. Yeah. Uh, but of course, uh, we, didn't, we didn't sort of uh, foresee that thing will come very soon. So we did not have the capacity. So what we did quickly was we addressed the capacity problem. So we, we contacted the vendors and we quickly enhanced the, 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 the capacity to enable us to uh, to, uh, to offer it to our student widely. Yeah, so that is addressing on the capacity. Next on our lecturer, uh, how how far has our uh, academic staff are prepared in order to do uh, to, to conduct the teaching and learning online? Uh, what we did was we quickly put together uh, the, the training uh, because we have quite a number of our academic staff very good at the uh, at, uh, adopt, uh, at using this platform to do their teaching and learning, of course, with some good ideas that are practical uh, and can be implementable on the system. So we use them to conduct the uh, the, the 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 training, yeah, the online training for our staff, and also we provide the online support should staff have problem, yeah, and that is where our uh, IT IT team as well as our training uh, people uh, who are residing with our center for excellence in teaching and learning so they provide that that uh, that that backup uh, over the uh, over the, the, the over the the first two weeks of uh, time in order to quickly transform our uh, our academic staff to address that and of course the next thing is one we have that how do we address the students yeah uh, this is where we we realize that uh, the student do some some foresighting as well, and they realize that if the teaching and learning is to go online, some of them may not have that accessibility. So they have decided to to sort of stick at UTP. Yeah, uh, and of course those who have gone home, we try what we could in order to facilitate them in order to get the access to internet. Uh, but from what uh, from the meetings that. Uh, anchoring at UTP, uh, from what I learned, uh, we seem to have that problem. Uh, and thank God, uh, our students have access. Almost all of them have access to the uh, to, to the uh, uh, internet access as well as sufficient bandwidth in order to undertake the online teaching and learning. And the next thing was how do we because we are nearing to the uh, to the end of the semester. Yeah. How do we, uh, we are nearing to the to the end of the semester. Then the next thing is, how do we address the assessment? And this is where uh, our university academic committee, chaired by our deputy vice chancellor academic, have a, a good and thorough discussion with uh, uh, with the uh, with the expert we had at Center of Excellent Teaching and Learning at UTP, as well as uh, the networking that we had, as well as with our uh, academic staff to develop, right? Uh, the kind of uh, 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 of assessment that can uh, substitute the final exam. Of course, we can't do a final exam because uh, integrity will not be there. The, the, the whole lot of that. So we have adopted more towards a kind of a project uh, or kind of take home uh, examination for the student to do. And uh, mind you, having said that, the questions are not exactly the same in a way so that then the students uh, can do because they have to do it within a certain period of time. Yeah, a certain period of time 
in front of a computer. And then they've got to submit it within a, uh, within a given period of time. Uh, we not exactly as short as during the final exam, but uh, but long enough uh, for them to do the problem uh, without in doing the interaction uh, behind with their colleagues. Eh? So there are measures we have adopted. Now, Dr. Liu, I think I'm close to my 10 minutes. Uh, I think uh, I should stop there to give way to my my fellow uh, speakers, eh? Prof. Ong and Prof. Uh, Farhan. Thank you. I, okay. I rest Thank for you. that. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, uh, again, uh, thanks a lot to uh, Prof. Professor Ibrahim for his sharing. So the next uh, speaker, I would like to invite uh, Professor Hon Sim Ong to share uh, the experience or the challenges that the Unis in Nottingham Malaysia is facing and how they tackle the problem. Uh, Prof. Ong. Yeah. I Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Liu, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, so I would like to share with you a little bit on the experience of University of Nottingham Malaysia campus. No slide yet, please. Huh? Sorry. Am I seeing sharing slides? Sorry. S sorry, Dr. Liu, my slides are for the second part. Okay. May I may I begin again? Sorry. Okay. Yep. Um. So I would like to thank uh, University uh, Tunggu Abdurrahman for giving me this opportunity to speak at the live uh, webinar. Um. So for the first part of this series is to talk about how our institution respond to the challenges of uh, COVID-19 with regards to teaching and learning. So as you know, University of Nottingham, Malaysia is a branch campus of the University of Nottingham. So we have been here for 20 years already. Now, um, to kind of like what we call uh, in Bahasa, we say Mayan film uh, in our minds, <laughs> going back to the time when COVID you know, first hit us and the announcement, like what Dr. Uh, Professor Ibrahim has said, you know, the announcement was made on the 16th of March and it is it was effective two days later. So what I'm going to say is that being a branch campus, we, we are actually taking also the practices of our of the UK campus because our philosophy is one university, three campuses. And we have another, we, our another branch is actually in China, Ningbo. So we learn a lot from Ningbo in the sense about the severity of COVID because as you know, China by that time was already on the lockdown. Now, in fact, uh, we were already preparing for online delivery, to be honest. Uh, so it's a little bit different maybe from many of the uh, institutions in Malaysia. So going back a little bit into the history, uh, we have been doing a lot of lecture capture already. Even before COVID, uh, we started lecture capture about four to five years ago. So when our lecturers um, deliver their lecture face to face at that time, all the lectures were up were recorded and uploaded onto the um, uh, Moodle. So students can always take benefit from the recorded uh, lectures. So that is uh, kind of like where we first started, and. Later on, we have even moved on to online marking and online feedback for students. So when COVID came and the campus has to shut down, what I'm trying to say here is that basically we are not new to lecture capture and online marking of assessment. Now, so what happened was the week during the week of our, uh, what do you call that, the, um, the announcement 
of the uh, what we call that the MCO by the Malaysian government, we were actually uh, in the midst of our transition week. So we transition. So we that week we take it as an opportunity. So there were no classes. We were actually um, training, giving support to all the academic staff as well as students on how to use team for online lectures. So if, you, if, if I may say it, at that point in time, we are basically actually uh, giving training to people how to use the technology. Forget about the pedagogy part at the moment. That comes later, actually. Uh, so we got everybody ready to actually use uh, online teaching and online learning. So then um, when we move on to the actual learning, online learning, so we do not see much of uh, hurdles or barriers. However, one point that has created anxiety for us is the regulation uh, by the government at first to say that only those ODL universities are allowed to conduct online lectures. So we panic. If we are not allowed online lectures, how are we going to continue uh, delivering our teaching and learning? But that worry was um, quickly um, become a reality, uh, become something that we shouldn't be worrying about anymore because the government, you know, uh, realized that it is good for us to be able to provide teaching and learning online. So that was actually a very good, uh, very good move by the government. And so we were able to uh, actually uh, carry out our teaching and learning. Now, what has become very useful to know is that, um, and that's not our university alone. I have also heard from my colleagues in other universities that if attendance previously was a little bit of a problem, has now become no problem at all. So I guess it is at the comfort of the home. And so everybody was able to uh, lock on and uh, listen to the lectures. And also another part that we found out very useful is that students started to engage and ask a lot of questions. Because, you know, they can hide behind the screen, you know, without exposing who you are and they can confidently ask the question versus the normal face to face situation where sometimes, you know, students are a bit reluctant, you know, and a bit shy in asking questions. So these were all the pluses, you know, however, it doesn't mean that online is all a bed of roses. Uh, we also found out that in spite of all the good things to say about online delivery, students somehow feel that there is a, how do I call it? Huh? They miss that physical interactions with their lecturers and as well as the, with their fellow students. So that is the, the case. Uh, when it comes to assessment, I think we have no problem moving on to online assessment. Uh, so like what Prof. Uh, Ibrahim has said, you know, we use more of a formative assessment. We also have take home exams. And, um, and uh, with regards to internet connectivity issue, I don't think we face major problems with that. Um, no denying there are hiccups along the way and i still can recall that you know uh, during the first week or first two weeks of COVID uh mco uh the management board of the um, university actually met every day to talk about issues and how to overcome problems and how do we continue to support students and what could be assessed what could not be and so on and so forth so I guess all of us, you know, come through this difficult time, challenging time uh, with a very steep learning curve. So I think I will not say any more. I will uh, uh, hand this session back to uh, Dr. Liu, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ong. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so next I would like to invite uh, Professor uh, Bam 
to share his ex experience at uh, Unity Science Malaysia. Professor Farm, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Very good afternoon, all. Thank you for joining the session. Thank you to Utah for inviting me to share uh, our experience at University Science Malaysia. I think the selection of the panel members uh, have been done nicely. Uh, we have a representative from a public private university, from an uh, international university, and I'm speaking on behalf of the public university, uh, and a big one. Uh, we have 30, 31,000 students. 60% uh, of our student is uh, in the B40 category. So in a way, uh, that, that adds up uh, or, or that adds to the challenges uh, that we have to face. Can I have the slides, please? Uh, I shall use some slides to uh, my slide to um, help me go through uh, my points of experience so that I think uh, hopefully some of you can, can, can learn and can perhaps uh, benefit from our experience. Uh, and um, and we, at, uh, next please, can we have the, the next slide? We actually, uh, I would like to share with you the, the entire experience uh, based on uh, the, following, um, the following items. First of all, of course, tackling the apprehension. I think both my, my colleagues have uh, shared how we were caught uh, early days, but at USM, I think we, we, we were expecting this to happen because we have been uh, managing our students from China coming back. Uh, we were in week four, week four so f about four to six weeks prior to the date, our Chinese students were uh, about to come back and uh, we had to manage them as we all know, and that in a way will prepare the whole university uh, mentally for the potential pandemic or outbreak. So we actually uh, painted several scenarios quite early, and, uh, and that was a very helpful uh, exercise because we were, we were able to, to look at uh, various options to, to tackle the different scenarios that we painted, and uh, and I think, uh, but but of course that was more at the top management of the university. Uh, we then, uh, after uh, MCO was announced uh, for the 18th of April of March, uh, we quickly put a mission that semester two had to go on because at that time Ministry of Higher Education being very new uh, with the change of government and so on, uh, did not put any announcement. So we, we exercised our autonomy. See, we said that we would like to rescue semester two because we were quite early uh, in the semester, uh, week four. So that, that was a very important decision uh, because if we had not made that decision, there were a lot of uncertainties uh, in the things that we have to do. So that was something that, uh, in hindsight, uh, something that was very important. Uh, by putting students continue uh, to be learning, and we were looking forward to uh, recommence our semester two after the break that they had because they were they, uh, because we were asked to shut universities uh, with MCO. So, so we, we quickly underline what we wanted to do. Students must continue uh, learn. Uh, we must always maintain safety because uh, about 25% of our students remain in campus. And of course, uh, while doing the online learning, we are mindful of the quality that we must maintain. Uh, again, at that time, uh, MQA has not come out with guidelines or the professional bodies have not come out with gu guidelines. So we were, we were actually planning, uh, hoping that uh, all the professional bodies and the accreditation bodies would uh, be flexible under the pandemic uh, situation. So, uh, so we quickly uh, also came up with the enabling governance. And one of the most 
uh, important thing that we decided upon was to come up with a new calendar or the adjusted calendar. And we anticipated that with all the disturbances, uh, we would like to buy time as much as possible. Our plan, we anticipated perhaps uh, the, the COVID will be better by June. So our original plan was for students to be able to come in uh, to campus by June after Raya. And we can actually com uh, continue with activities of face-to-face -face that uh, cannot be substituted online. So that was our plan. And of course, we have a large number of postgraduates. So we had to also think about them. So we had a we had an early June uh, milestone for things to be to be stable and to come back. So these are all part of the governance that we had done earlier with the calendar. Uh, I think that's another important uh, move uh, that that USM has done. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? I, I'll just share with you our strategy uh, early early on. Can I have the next slide, please? So this, this is basically... Uh, this mic is on. <laughs> Okay. Aku saja yang jadi. Untuk akademik, to, to, kita boleh sampai orang yang sekolah uh, datang. If, dia akan buat confirm tak masalah. Cuma, aku... Uh, ah, kena lapi, itu confirm. Okay, alright. Can I continue? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, okay, alright. So, so this is partly to explain the the governance that we, we took early on. We quickly uh, decided on a date to continue with our uh, uh, semester. And we chose 5th and 6th April because we have a campus in Kelantan. So they started on the 5th and on the 6th for the rest of us in Penang uh, campus. And, and uh, we decided to go online as much as possible. Uh, we also uh, knew, as, as my colleagues have shared, that we need to amend the assessment method. Uh, this was very tricky because uh, our our courses are primarily 50%, 60% uh, or 40% exam, final exams. And we had to uh, uh, really understand um, balancing between uh, substituting the final exam with continuous assessment while maintaining the learning outcomes and also ensuring student learning time uh, is more or less the same. So we had to do that juggle with all our courses. And we also had a strategy to reduce all face-to-face -face, uh, activities, uh, um, fearing that our target of bringing everybody in campus by June will not be realized. So that was done very early on. As you can see, it was uh, this diagram I drew on the 27th of March, 2020. So, so there were many uh, governance matters that we had to do, and we were very uh, thankful that MQA also reacted very fast and had given a lot of flexibility and following suit, all the professional bodies also came up with their guidelines. So I think this is something that, that is wonderful, uh, and we also hope that they will continue to be, uh, to be flexible uh, in, in, in years to come. Next, please. So then, ladies and gentlemen, we talk about preparing everybody to do the job because uh, once the, gap, the governance is established, we need to prepare uh, the team and we had the uh, lecturers in mind and the students also need to be looked after. Uh, unlike uh, Nottingham, uh, our culture at USM was not uh, over zealous, over enthusiastic about online learning. Uh, but uh, despite us trying to promote it, but it was a slow starter for, for many. So we had to find ways how to prepare everybody. We had about two weeks from the decision to class starting. So there was a mad rush to ed educate everybody. Uh, and uh, the buying in process was very important, especially the deans, because they also in turn have to make sure that all their staff uh, follow suit with what we have decided. Next slide, please. These are some examples of things that we did. Uh, this is to show the, perhaps the scale of our university. We have 16,000 students that are potentially 
uh, going through the online learning uh, about that number of courses and we had to do all this within two weeks before we started class uh, with all the Senate approval and, and so on. Next slide, please. We also came up with all these kind of guides to prepare the community, uh, academic as well as students, uh, to give them simple guide what is remote learning. It is a mindset change. You know, we have slides uh, explanation for, for different groups of people, uh, undergrad, postgrad, and also the lecturers. Uh, next, please. Uh, we also uh, had a lot of videos uh, through our YouTube channel, uh, our Center for Development of Academic Excellence, we call CDAE, was very busy, but they were very happy because they have been promoting online learning for so long, people just didn't care, but now everybody was forced to do so. I just did an analysis on Sunday. We have 108 videos, 50 hours uh, of uh, viewing hours uh, with that number of views. And uh, one thing that we agreed was to, because we have, we have potentially many students who may have problem accessing online learning, we have decided to tone down the delivery to a low bandwidth delivery so that we can do both synchronous and asynchronous uh, teaching. And that was a, an important decision. And as you can see, uh, our high, highest video view, viewership was on a simple cara mengajar menggunakan aplikasi WhatsApp. So I think that's very important if you have uh, uh, members of your students who are, are not able to have access. Uh, and uh, I, I share the, the, the link there. Please, please help yourself with it. And finally, next uh, is also about communication. Uh, we need to also uh, do a lot of communication. So this was the line of communication uh, that, that we did among the deans to make sure that we are all on the same page. Uh, and also next, uh, just to share with you some of this, uh, I can also share with you. This is compilation of the FAQ. There were a lot of questions and answers that we had to do. And I got tired in, us, in answering similar questions. So we came up with FAQ. And next, please, we also came up with several guidelines. How to do remote, remote teaching, how to take attendance. And these were uh, widely circulated. And uh, we are also very glad to share with you if you need them. I think that's my last slide. Sorry to have uh, run a bit uh, over time, uh, but I, I hope I, I have summarized uh, 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 the entire effort uh, from governance, preparation, and a bit on the execution. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Moderator. Okay, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Prof. Prof. Professor Half Palm. So, okay, uh, we have uh, finished the first round. So, the next round, I think, will be more important. Uh, how the learning and teaching landscape will be changed because of this pandemic of uh, COVID-19. I mean, we know that we need to stay, uh, um, keep the social distancing. So in terms of teaching, that means that we might not be able to put in many students in one classroom, or we may even encourage more online teaching and learning, but whether the students or the university or the lecturers can tap to it. So perhaps we can listen to the panelists to share their view, what would be the futures of the learning and teachings uh, post COVID-19. So uh, first of all, uh, I would like to invite again Professor Ibrahim to share about this. Prof Ibrahim. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Right, you can, you can hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, we can hear you. all right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we'll learn for the second round. Right. <clears throat> now, um, as you correctly pointed out, uh, the uh, the COVID-19 right, is, is issue will not go away very soon. Uh, this would depend on how fast uh, can the medical fraternity come up with the uh, with the required vaccine. But for time being, it looks like um, we will just have to uh, go along with whatever current practices that, that we are adopting as well as adjusting. Now, when we get um, going forward in the future, 
uh, I see, from the way I look at it, I see uh, two possible scenarios. Yeah. Now, currently we have, we may have a uh, mission which do traditional face-to-face. -face, yeah. Uh, as we go forward, uh, this face-to-face -face may uh, may not be done fully. So it may be like a combination of face-to-face -face with technology, uh, online technology, or to a to a further extent, it may go in, in entirety uh, in terms of using the online uh, online uh, teaching and learning technology. Yeah, but I think uh, a lot of the um, this is my thinking. Yeah, um, I feel that a lot of the uh, university that are offering, um, especially professional courses, they may not opt to go fully uh, on on ODL. Yeah. Unless uh, we, if we, if we have prepared all the, uh, the, the university or, or, or support that can take over, yeah, uh, or supplement or, or, or substitute the kind of experience, the kind of hands-on that we need the student to embark on, yeah. But the way I look at it, uh, this is my feeling. I think hybrid would be something that most university will be going on board, uh, which is a combination of face to face not much of actually doing the face to face for teaching but rather using using the face to face session to facilitate and and doing this uh, you see although you, you you can also do that online but the dynamics and the interaction some university uh, may value the dynamics and the interaction highly right and therefore you can sort of uh, adjust the the size of the classes so the time of the academician is better used for uh, managing and handling interactions rather than doing the face-to-face -face delivery. Face, face delivery can be done. Uh, the face-to-face so-called delivery can be taken over by the uh, by the online uh, uh, technique that we have. So this is where I, uh, uh, I'm looking at uh, the the way forward uh, for you know universities such as uh, UTP, yeah, because we we are we are offering a lot more of the professional courses per se, yeah. So and and on top of that, it's not just about the academic alone. Uh, it is also about what sort of graduates uh, does the university aspire to produce, yeah. Uh, if the university aspire to produce somebody uh, which have uh, a high degree of social interaction ability, right, confidence level in inter interacting with people, able to adjust themselves uh, in, in, in a group dynamics, working with people. Uh, of course, this session where you need to put people together uh, is not something that you, sh you, you should rule out per se. And there's another thing. Now, we, uh, in, 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 in my opinion, we need to bring students together to the university where we can then provide them with, uh, with some learning experience, uh, uh, with experience that may be able to help to develop them. Yeah? Not just from the angle of uh, doing the academic study, going through the academic uh, study, uh, uh, going through lecture, discussing what, but also on the uh, on the co-curricular activity, right? Because the co-curricular activity is something that I don't think uh, at this point in time. I may be wrong, but I don't think that uh, the online technique can actually substitute, yeah. Uh, the sports activity, the the arts and culture activity, uh, the uh, the CSR activity that they need to do with people. So this is another thing that and and a reason another reason why we need have the student on board in order to get that that interaction going. So from that angle, that is why I'm looking at um, at why going forward, I feel that blended learning would be the uh, uh, the, the the way forward, especially. Professional professional program, yeah. Um, and of course, in doing that, the university have to prepare. Uh, have to prepare themselves. Uh, I think 
uh, you know, like uh, what I've said earlier, uh, we have to overcome the digital divide. Yeah, uh, access to connectivity and bandwidth has to be made available. And I hope this will actually sing in as well with the government effort in order to uh, because now education is considered as uh, as something that is uh, that is to be made uh, uh, widely available. And uh, and in order uh, to be to be uh, going forward to be done partly uh, uh, on online and partly on the face that the the connectivity uh, enhancement has to be there the upgrading of the connectivity so that it will cover more widespread yeah for, for the population uh, and also there are other uh, practices that will be different yeah and and uh, and I'm thinking at the university administration angle uh, probably as we go forward the mod the model of university that we see may change yeah um, the technology will allow for this uh, to to actually take place uh, if i can take for example now uh, text textbooks for example yeah textbook will will probably be uh, obsolete per se rather than the student get the text the student on uh, on on the uh, the sources that they can get widely uh, hands on uh, based on the connectivity they have yeah uh, and also uh, library I think you all I, I guess you are aware UCP has a very big library but I think going forward uh, the library will tend to shrink I think in in the in the in the in the new model of the university as we get forward yeah. And then also the, uh, the the evolution in terms of assessment, it may go move away because it is not just about the knowledge that 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 we are testing the students, but it's also the interaction side, the the, the dynamics, uh, probably uh, peer evaluation and some uh, some other form of assessment has to come on board. Yeah, as we go forward. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, and, and 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 these are among the things that that uh, that you that I see will take place inshallah as as the uh, the model of the university uh, changes with time. Uh, there is one more thing that I that I I would like to share before I actually pass over because I'm sort of covering quite a, a wide a wide scope here. When you look at the opening of the university, yeah. I don't know. Uh, at the moment, of course, based on the hybrid model that I say that I that I that I propose uh, as the as the uh, way forward, the option of the university would require a physical location. Yeah, but the way we are putting our staff together, uh, there may be a difference. Yeah? Because if you allow for this uh, uh, for for this uh, uh, module to be acquired through uh, face uh, through through the online, then the that we need to put together will no longer be on 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 module delivery and and interaction and assessment, but it will be more on interaction and assessment. So maybe in terms of the staffing, yeah, staffing will change, yeah, uh, and teaching or learning will will be supported a lot more by 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 technology and hopefully, yeah, um, hopefully it will help also university to reduce the cost offering the program i think one of the problem now we had is the the cost of of, of offering uh, uh higher education is going up and up uh i think uh now i do i mean uh if you look at uh, uh we are feeling the pinch of actually getting students yeah because you need to also find the financial help that will be able to support the student as they come in particularly on the private university yeah uh, and then the pattern of learning given that we are balancing between uh, between this this face to face and the uh, the 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 online technique then possibly uh, the instead of having a regimented schedule the shift towards more of a personalized schedule would come in yeah um, and, and 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 these are uh, these are these are the things that, that 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 we need to also look at but one big challenge to the university is that if we are if we really move on towards this kind of model, how do we handle our R&D? Uh, that is something that 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 I still are thinking and and contemplating. How do we actually manage R&D as uh, as a university 
going into this direction. Uh, Dr. Liu, I think I've done almost 10 minutes there. Uh, yeah, I, I shall pass it over to my, my other two speakers then. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, uh, Prof. Ibrahim. Oh, okay, uh, to all the audience, I, I, I think you might not be able to access to these uh, chat box in order to ask questions. Perhaps after the end of the second round, I'll open it up to you. I mean, if any audience, if you like to ask any questions, perhaps you can turn on your mic. And then if, uh, I mean, if more than two uh, participants like to ask questions, perhaps I will, will allow one to ask the question first. Right, because uh, I, I think because you are invited to join this, you are not one of the team members for this meeting, so you might not be able to assess the chart. But anyway, okay, uh, uh, we will see how we can uh, uh, solve, resolve this problem. Okay, uh, next, uh, again, I would like to invite Professor Ong to, to uh, give uh, her views on what will be the futures of learning and teaching post COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu. So may I have my slides, please? Yep, next one, please. Next slide, yep, okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, again, it is a little bit about, uh, no, no. It is a little bit about University of um, Nottingham. As you can see, we have um, three, the previous slide, please. Yep, thank you. So as you can see, this is the University of Nottingham. So uh, it is uh, one university, three campuses. Uh, can you see on um, the left-hand side, the uh, images of our university? You can see that, you know, uh, we have a clock tower and a lake in all the campuses. Unfortunately, you can't see the lake here. So we are 20 years in Malaysia. So this is just to show you the beautiful campuses. So now into the subject proper about um, how are we going to move on post COVID-19. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to, uh, before we talk about everything, we will look at the, uh, uh, the uh, higher education, the landscape of higher education in Malaysia. So, you know, a private or uh, higher education really flourished and developed due to liberalization in the education sector. So first and foremost, we have the, what we call the massification of uh, university education. So everybody wanted an, a university education. And that is because of the demographics, because, you know, we have got people, I mean, the, the kind of age group that come into the university sector. This doesn't happen just in our own country, but it also happens uh, around the world. And in fact, the demand for higher education has gone on to now what we call the less uh, developed or the, rather the developing countries, you know, especially the ASEAN countries. So because of this massification and because, you know, we have got a lot of institution coming in and we have got increasing complexity as a result of that. And it's also because of competition, we also have... Um, increasing the situation of uh, increasing complexity and competition. So what happened next is that, you know, there is pressure to perform. So now the pressure to perform, you know, pre-COVID, I must say that it is very different from COVID now that we are still undergoing the pandemic and after the COVID. Uh, in fact, the pressure to perform uh, the pre-COVID days, we are already looking a lot into technology-driven kind of modalities. Uh, before COVID, actually, we were talking about a lot, a lot about the the fourth industrial revolution. Um, of course, you know there is entirely another huge topic which I will not talk about today. But 
as a result of this 4IR, I think most institutions, if not all, are beginning to look at technology and how can digital technology help in uh, higher education. We already have heard a lot about people promoting MOOCs, you know, and so on and so forth. Now, with COVID, the pressure to perform has changed a lot. So if pre-COVID days, if you're talking about the, you know, making surpluses and reinvestment and things like that, I must say that COVID, the pandemic is very disruptive, not just for the higher education sector alone, but it's also disruptive disruptive to the whole economy. In fact, the whole world is predicting a recession as a result of that. So therefore, if I can speculate, post-COVID, uh, we are all looking at survival. In fact, um, Jack Ma, you know, the um, it's a household name. And he has said that, you know, survival is something that every organization should look at. So survival, huh? that's important for all of us. Um, then, of course, you know, we want to talk about the next slide, please. We want to talk about the uh, teaching and learning post COVID. And you can ask what kind of uh, strategies, you know, but in order to talk about the strategies, we have to look at what do we know about teaching and learning. So like what I have mentioned earlier, we are talking about the digital technology. Now, digital technology, if in the past it is used as a POD, sorry, this is a marketing jargon, but I will explain. POD means point of difference and POP means a point of parity. So if digital technology is a point of difference that allows us to differentiate our learning experiences to our students and say that, you know, we use a lot of digital technology, you could do this, do that, you know, uh, what do you call that, AI and big data and so on as a differentiator. Now, almost immediately with COVID, it has become the point of parity. Why? Because, you know, all of us are actually using the digital enabled teaching and learning methods. So, um, therefore, we are looking at online delivery. So, like uh, my fellow speakers have said earlier on, if very quickly we moved on to online delivery, using the technology. So like I also mentioned earlier that, in fact, um, when we were getting ready, before even the announcement on MCO, um, we were looking at it more as using it, you know, uh, the training is basically using the technology. However, I must say that post COVID, if we are still looking at online de delivery, if students are not allowed into campus, then even at this point in time, we are looking at quality online delivery, no longer just using the technology. What I mean by quality online delivery, I shall elaborate uh, shortly. So next, again, we need to ask the question, how do we ensure student experience if interactions continue to be digitally driven. So we, we know, we have read, you know, um, um, uh, people have published that, you know, um, even before COVID, huh, people have already talk, talked about um, students not entirely happy with low or no contact with lecturers or fellow students. Uh, in fact, there is a book published in December 2019. It is called The University of the Future. However, nobody predicted the pandemic, but some of the things covered in that book, it's very, very useful. You might want to take a look at that book. Sorry for the digression. Coming back to my presentation, then, you know, if we know that teaching and learning is not just about 
uh, students passively receiving knowledge or actively engage in learning. We need to look at also the totality of the student experience. Um, so therefore, student experience is something that we got to seriously look at. So the, my fourth point is about pedagogy and assessment. That's where I'm going to link back to point number two about moving to quality online delivery. Up till the stage of um, pre-COVID, I think what we have generally, I say generally, huh, generally done is very kind of a teacher-centric uh, teaching approach where uh, the teacher is a sage, you know, delivering knowledge and students students actually are passive learners. So if we want to move on to a bit more of quality online delivery, how do we then engage students and change that from student cent from sorry, from teacher centric learning to more of student centric learning? There are many, a lit, uh, there are a lot of uh, actually research and um, text uh, publications out there to talk about how do we engage student-centric learning. Uh, I'm going to mention some of them and you may say that, look, this is what we have already been doing. Yes, we do know that some of you may do some of the things, but post-COVID, we are talking about the emphasis. So what I'm trying to say here is that if previously we have concentrated or we emphasize on teacher centric kind of teaching and learning, we may now have to move towards more of the student centric learning. For example, like role playing, um, the um, case studies, uh, living cases, some of you use PBL, uh, field study, internships, uh, online videos, flip classrooms, um, Another thing worth looking at is micro, micro certification, MOOCs, uh, getting students to do reflective journals, uh, reflective assignments. So all these are moving more towards what we call the formative kind of assessment. Uh, however, uh, so sorry, coming back to this uh, student centric learning. So these are some of the things that we could do and some of the things that we could do more. So therefore, post COVID and if students are allowed to come in, we are actually looking at um, perhaps not moving back to the pre COVID days where face to face happen in the old model. What we are saying is even if students are allowed on campus, we do not know whether the social distancing rules have to be applied or not. It's an uncertainty. So therefore, we have to be prepared for all that. So if, if, if uh, social distancing is a must and is a norm, how do we then ensure that, you know, uh, 300 students or 200 students in a normal pre-COVID class, how can we deliver that? Right. So therefore, we have no choice but to be, but we must be able to move on to some form of blended learning. So now about assessment, what do we do with assessment? So assessment again, you know, may have to move forward to more of a bit more about the uh, online um, uh, method, you know, and uh, more formative assessment. However, we have to pay uh, attention to the needs of the professional bodies and make sure that we meet with their requirements. So this is still the uh, COVID period. We do not know how that will be, that how, will, how that will change or how that will evolve. We'll just have to wait and see. So the next question then is about employability. Now, we must always remember that employability is very important for students. And what kind of employability we are talking about? So if you look at 
some of the publications about skill sets that employers need um, post-COVID. Uh, I had a look at, the, at several articles and actually they mentioned almost about the same thing, critical thinking, leadership, you know, capability and so on and so forth. Therefore, what I'm going to suggest is that, you know, in order to ensure employability for the students, we must be able to give them competent based skills. Now, how we are all going to achieve all that thing, I would actually think that you need to look at your institutional structure and capabilities. That will bring me to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. So what are the factors to that we should uh, consider? You can see that, you know, I have put in a lot of things, you know, our brand and our brand promise, uh, quality assurance, don't forget that, you know. Uh, we need the governance. Um, we need the role, the regulators here to be um, sector, higher education sector friendly without compromising uh, quality assurance of the promise to our students. We must be able to manage risk. Uh, we must be able to um, continue to use technology and most importantly, when we talk about uh, survival, you know, how we can survive, cost management is very, very important. Uh, in ensuring cost management, it is perhaps for us, good for us to look at productivity again, to visit, revisit productivity and how we can use technology to uh, further enhance our profit, uh, sorry, our our ca capability, you know, and how how we can meet cost uh, requirements based on our productivity. So the next important point is, um, can you click again, please? Yeah. So what is important for all organisation is that we must be agile, because the pandemic has caused so much of uncertainty. Without agility, I think it's very difficult for us to be able to respond uh, to the pandemic very quickly. I think up till now, Malaysia has done very well huh, in um, combating, uh, in fighting the COVID-19. And at the same time, I think all of us have been very cooperative uh, in ensuring that we all fight this so-called virus war together. Uh, but as an organization, if you want to survive and so on and so forth, I think agility is something that we have to look at. So with that, I would like to thank you. I hope I have not exceeded my time allocation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ong. So, uh, Okay, next I would like to invite again uh, Professor Faham to share uh, his view about the futures of learning and teaching uh, post-COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Liu. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi again. Uh, I think my colleagues have covered um, many of the challenges and also tips on how we should um, go through the future days uh, of uh, uh, our, you know, our university after COVID-19. Uh, uh, can I have the slides, please? Um, I have a, just a simple guiding slide for us to, for me to provide my points. Um, I think uh, we were told that COVID uh, will be with us to stay and uh, we need to adapt ourselves uh, to it. And uh, we, we are talking immediately to be post P PKP rather than post COVID. And then I think, uh, on this, um, I think organization or institution of higher learning must must have uh, something that, that is an aim of the university. Of course, many of us will have the organizational aim, but as far as teaching and learning, uh, USM is committed to provide the best learning experience to all our students. And I think when we talk about learning experience, it's not only to equip them with the knowledge 
that they 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 want or they acquire in the academic programs but <clears throat> more importantly to prepare them for the challenging times in the real world uh, all the attributes uh, that employers want from them the society wants from them and i'm sure the students themselves would want to have uh, these attributes in the future so so how do we do that uh, under the 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 new norm or the new challenges and i think the new normal is something that that we need to be uh, uh, clear on um I think immediately we, we were told that a face-to-face -face session will be uh, very challenging for us to do. So the question is, can students' learning experience be the same? Or, or do we have opportunities uh, to enhance their learning experience? So I think these are, these are of course, questions that, that no one can answer yet, but we can only theorize or hypothesize. Uh, should we go back to before or this is a time to move forward? And I think um, perhaps under such situation, we are forced to be out of our comfort zone and we are being forced to change. I think one of the stigma of uh, universities, especially University Awam or the public universities is uh, being in our comfort zone. I think we used to have um, students ready. We don't have to fight for students, uh, except recently, perhaps, uh, especially uh, the RUs, uh, the, the research universities are now uh, under pressure to perform, to be independent and to have more students. But, but more or less, I think the, the whole uh, uh, institution are perhaps going on as normal and perhaps needed this pandemic to jolt us up and you know to wake us up and to say that hey we it, we also need to survive as other universities so perhaps this is a good time for us to change and and i think the next question is what would be the formula and i think um, a lot of people have given their ideas through many years of research but to to us at usm at least to me uh, our current experience provide us with the best opportunity to experiment with 16,000 students' learning experience. Having to change the approach of teaching almost instantly and yet to know uh, the learning outcomes, though we have uh, deliberately designed our, our teaching to, to be able to deliver the learning outcomes in our students, but we have yet to see the, the actual outcome. We, we need to assess them perhaps towards the end of our semester. And, but again, it provides uh, a lot of inputs, feedbacks. And uh, to me, it is, is, a, is a wealth uh, of uh, research material that, that can actually answer a lot of burning questions with regards to the future of learning and teaching. Uh, post-COVID. So we are doing this at USM. Uh, we are on week five of online learning and weekly our uh, deans uh, have been tasked to look for uh, important findings, uh, complaints, issues from both uh, provider and learner. And uh, we are also planning to do a more comprehensive survey. Uh, if COVID also has various waves, teaching and learning during COVID, COVID pandemic also have two waves. The first wave was immediately prior to starting online learning for USM on the 6th of April. Uh, but uh, we are also facing a second wave because, uh, as you all know, the government has decided to allow our students to go back last week and this week. And we anticipate some of the students who have gone back will now realize that their environment at home is not the same as the environment that we provide in the university. So we are expecting another wave of uh, issues that we need to address just uh, after we have sort of stabilized the first group. But these are again all very nice challenges and uh, and we have actually empowered our academic staff and I'm very glad 
to see that our academic staff at USM has responded well, being very agile, being very uh, creative and innovative, and being very patient uh, to accommodate to all the shortcomings of the student. As, as, you, as I've told you, uh, not everyone at USM will have access uh, to the internet. So our strategy of bringing our learning to the lowest bandwidth have sort of worked uh, because uh, uh, our latest count, uh, the numbers are manageable for us to do intervention otherwise. Then, then the next thing is to address, uh, uh, again, the, the formula about expectations. Uh, we always talk about what we feel the students need, but what about their needs? What are their expectations? What are, what are things that they want? You know? But of course, we, we will not be able to entertain all the what the students want for being uh, uh, you know, in that age group. Uh, but I think we need to understand more about their learning experience. And I, again, uh, with the current experience, we have uh, a lot of opportunity to know more and to uh, adjust our approaches better. So at the end of the day, uh, the knowledge, skill and competencies that the student expect and should have will be able to be imparted uh, effectively by us. And, uh, uh, and the stakeholders' expectation, you know, this is also a very uh, opportune time for us to experiment on this. Uh, the professional body's expectation, the employer's expectation. So our question is that can we also influence their expectation with all the changes that are happening? And I think at, 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 uh, at the moment, uh, at least while we are going through this pandemic, uh, things have been great. Everybody has been accommodative. Uh, we are putting outcome first rather than being more too over prescribing. So I think this, these are uh, a very welcoming change, which I hope will be sustained. Then we talk about teaching and learning method and approaches. I think there's a lot uh, of this is being talked about. Uh, the question is, where, between the present and the appropriate. And I think, again, what is appropriate is something that, that still needs to be answered. Uh, and we, we do hope at USM we are able to cater for our students' needs. Uh, uh, questions like, are we giving our students too much? In fact, that is already a finding that I can, I can surely uh, confirm. Uh, when we try to jog between... Uh, uh, exams and continuous assessment, we, we do realize that we are giving too much to our students. Their student learning time is a bit excessive. So, so that is something that we can answer better, whether learning can happen better uh, without too much of SLT. We question the issue of outcome-based versus process-based. We also uh, question uh, the issue of receiving which our students are doing so much uh, uh, now by listening, like all our audience today, how much is being learned and how much is being actualized so that it can be emulated, it can be learned, it can be uh, practiced. So I think this is a very important question that we need to answer. And therefore, the ultimate question of conventional teaching versus something that is new, that requires adaptability, flexibility, will have to come in. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we also need to be aware of the pressures. Uh, I think even, even though as a public university, we have to address the issue of business versus university idealism, how to strike the right balance between the two, you know, between treating our students as students and learners as opposed to clients and customers. I think uh, a lot has thought, you know, I've seen a lot of very positive outlook where the lecturers are actually treating them as learners, not just a number, not just an attendee of a class, but making sure that they get the teaching material and 
you know, when, when there's problem with our line, our network, they take the extra effort to make sure that every student gets the learning material. And I think this is so, you know, uh, uh, um, heartening to, to see and to witness. There's also still among us lecturers the issue of self, you know, promotion, glorification, progress in career versus altruism. Uh, I think uh, the challenge is now how much do we care for our students uh, in, in the hardship, in, in the times of hardship. And it, I think this is where altruism will surface. And an organization where altruism wins, I think, has a lot of better future uh, in, 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 in the challenging days to come. So, so my final word is actually the word empowerment. While, while I agree we have to be agile, but I, I am actually enjoying my last slide, please. I'm enjoying the empowering uh, or the empowerment that has been given. Uh, uh, Ministry of Health talks about community empowerment as the most important enabler for us to get it take, to get out of uh, our COVID situation. And I think when university is being empowered by so many people, so many stakeholders, I think we can think clearer. We are more agile. We have less constraints. And in turn, university will empower the faculty, the deans, to also uh, understand. They understand the culture of their faculty. They understand the students' ways better. So we empower them to actually do the best teaching and learning and to provide the best learning experience. And finally, the academic staff also empower the students to uphold integrity, especially with regards to assessment, to be disciplined enough, even though you are doing asynchronous, you must keep to the teaching plan or the learning plan. And hopefully at the end of the day, we will also mature not only the university, but the academic staff, but more importantly, to give increasing in maturity to our students so that they need not to be spoon fed. They can take care and be independent and they can be disciplined enough to have all the attributes that we have, we wish for them to have as a 21st century learners and to face the many challenges in the future. So that those are my thoughts about the future of uh, teaching and learning, maybe a bit on uh, a different approach, uh, but I do hope it has been beneficial to all uh, our audience. So I pass it back to Dr. Liu uh, with my thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Prof. Prof Faham, all right. So uh, I think we have uh, we just had a very um, interesting and comprehensive uh, sharing by the three panelists about the futures. I mean, post COVID nineteen, what will be the futures of learning and teachings? So uh, Prof. Ibrahim talking about uh, a hybrid model. This will be the futures, and also uh, 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 Prof. Ong also talk about uh, how we should use the technologies. I mean, in line with this IR 4.0, so how this uh, education may be changed, right? Not only for learning and teaching, but also even the management of the university might need to change. And uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Farm talk about, about the students' expectation experience, how we can integrate all the, uh, the, the lectures and also the students' expectation experience, and then make the learning and teaching uh, better, right? So uh, 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 the, thank you very much for three panelists. And so now we open to the audience. If you have any questions, uh, you can because you you you. I don't think you can post the questions through the chat board box. Maybe you just uh, if you want to have you have any questions, can you just turn on the mic and then ask the questions? Excuse me. Yeah. Excuse okay. me. Yeah. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Azrul Hashimi Zawidi from UTP Student Mobility Office. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, I have one question. Uh, uh, okay, uh, first of all, thank you to uh, to the to all panels, uh, uh, Professor Ong, Professor Farhan, uh, Professor Yosef, uh, and my boss, uh, Professor Ibrahim. Okay, I'm from Student Mobility Office of UTP. I would like to know on the future of um, uh, future plan or with regards to student mobility activities such as students exchange, research attachment and so on and so forth. So my question is, is it 
uh, all got stopped or there's a changes in the nature of uh, mobility activities? That's that's my question. What so is your nature? question is to which which panelists or trade or uh, any all any the... anyone yeah anyone okay. yes this yes, is it's an open question. Thank you very much. Thank you. So any of the uh, pa our panelists, distinguished panelists, would you like to answer this regarding the student mobility? So whether there will be any no. change? Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Liu, shall I go first? <laughs> but anyway, because sure, this, sure, this sure. is a question yeah. that comes from my my my, my guys. Uh, okay. If you look at um, the future, <laughs> sorry, Ezra, but I think looking at the future, post-COVID, we have managed to settle the vaccine issue uh, when interaction can be, can be made possible back. I think uh, the, the internationalization exposure, uh, the mobility has to, we have to continue with that. Because uh, I, I still find it very difficult to, um, I don't know, maybe uh, Prof Ong can, uh, can, uh, can, can share you know, from the, uh, uh, the perspective of the, uh, the virtual platform, whether the experience uh, and the learning uh, that, 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 that goes along with the mobility program can be substituted, you know, uh, by a virtual platform. But I think as we go on, once we are managed to tackle post-COVID-19, we are able to tackle and we are allowed to do that. Or even if we are going into the new norm of actually practicing social distancing, I think to a certain extent, when the travel is allowed to be done, we need to actually uh, continue with that student mobility program to allow to give our student that exposure needed in order to make them a global citizen yeah, and understand the whole lot of the complexity and the dynamics of the world. Uh, I think that is uh, uh, my, my, my bit and probably uh, 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 Prof Ong uh, or Prof Arhan can, can add on. Thank you. Yep, and so thanks, uh, Prof Ibrahim. So I think um, the question about student mobility. So I think in the University of Nottingham, we have the two plus two program for our pharmacy program. So students stay two years here and spend another two years uh, in the UK campus. We also have another type of mobility, which is just kind of like exchange for a semester or for one year. Um, in fact, the U our UK campus has drawn up a lot, I mean, a lot of thoughts and time and effort have been put in to look at how to resolve all these issues as a result of the pandemic. Um, so one point that I highlighted to the UK campus is that we are looking at the pandemic situation that varies across countries, right? So when China was first hit, China was on lockdown. And now China is back to face-to-face. -to -face. You know, our Ningbo campus is already back to face-to-face -to -face, uh, delivery. And so, and then UK, the situation of the pandemic is much, much worse than in Malaysia. So we are, we are actually looking at the different COVID situations. So the, back to the question of mobility. So even if Malaysia is ready to send, send students that our border is open, but we are not sure whether the UK border is open or not. And likewise, I'm just using the case of um, UK and Malaysia as an example. But if you are looking into the totality of student mobility, you are looking at you know U21, you know students all from Australia, Europe, and everywhere, and moving about you know globally to um, to have that 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 kind of student experience and teaching and learning. Um, the immediate the answer to the immediate situation is that mobility may not be possible at this moment. And especially with, even if the borders are opened, um, you know, you have social distancing in place. Are the institutions that we are, we are partnering with, are they ready to accept this extra, so to speak, extra kind of students? Moving forward, um, yes, so for, like for our pharmacy program, it is um, mandated by uh, the professional body that certain learning outcomes must be achieved. And so how do we do that? 
uh, we are, I don't have a ready answer to be very honest. We are still working on how do we deal with um, the uh, situation if at all um, the uh, the uh, pandemic uh, it's it, it, it's still affecting us. Uh, one of the possibilities that we are looking at is that can students continue to learn in Malaysia or in China, even if um, an exchange has to take place? So again, you know, we have to go back to our our quality assurance standards with, with our manual to look at what is allowable and what is not allowable. So I would imagine, you know, um, to cut the long story short, I would imagine that there will be different, different modalities to this student mobility. Uh, but suffice to say that, you know, we would like students to move and enjoy that student um, and learn the kind of, a, and, and enjoy the student experience as much as uh, pre-COVID days. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Prof. Fam, you want to say something about this um, issue? Uh, yeah, I think, thank you. I think this is very challenging. I, I, don't, I think we, we are enjoying uh, the mobility programs because we want to create a, a, a global citizen internationalization at home and so on. But I guess uh, they cannot move uh, at the moment. People, uh, students cannot move. So, so maybe we if we if we want to continue to achieve the the desired outcomes we we have to be creative uh, to still provide the the you know the the sharing culture the internationalization experience uh, in in other ways uh, but but of course that is quite easily done uh, through all the technology that is available uh, so yeah it will be uh, quiet I think uh, for some time until we can start moving internationally. Uh, but I, I do not undermine the possibilities of people being creative and still getting the outcomes uh, uh, as a result. So, you know, I, I hope your office will not be quiet <laughs> uh, because uh, I think there are still things that needs to be done uh, on, on mobility, perhaps uh, in, another, in another way. That's, that's my short answer or response. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, due to time constraint, perhaps we take one more questions. Any other questions from the uh, audience? Um, excuse me, can I yeah. ask a question? Yes, yes, yes I'm please. I'm from uh, Faculty of Arts and Social Science, uh, University to go up the Um, I, I was actually drawn to this, uh, the experience shared by Prof Ong earlier. Uh, she said that, okay, Nottingham University has actually um, get used to this, um, you know, um, having these uh, lecture captures, right, especially after each uh, lecture sessions, to allow the students to have the access, right, to the web, uh, video recording of the lectures. So I wonder that, I mean, and she mentioned that that was actually, okay, used to complement, right, the face-to-face -face, uh, lecture and tutorials. But today, as we see that, okay, now we are facing this, um, you know, um, movement, we are under this uh, movement control order, and we are not able to really have this, uh, you know, close um, contact with the, anyone, all right? So that means that, okay, the online lecture is now the mainstream, and the offline uh, campus uh, activities will be the, I mean, complementary uh, activities that could actually enhance student learning. My question is, how do we go about to truly to create this opportunity for the students to meet physically while keeping you know, a safe distance from one another right, to protect each other's health? Okay, so is there a way out uh, over this? Because uh, I checked with my students, they are, they are, despite the fact that they, were, they got excited at the very beginning, but they began to miss those opportunities for them to hang around in a campus and then making a visit to lecturer's uh, room and discuss and know with the lecturer their concern and maybe their assignments. So I hope that I can get the enlightenment from the panel. Thanks. So if, if not mistaken, your question is about the explanations from the students. So in the beginning, they are still excited with the online teaching and learning, but later on, they start to think about and then actually they prefer the traditional way of face-to-face -face way. 
But yes. of course now now they can't do that. Then how should we how can we handle this issue? Or should we uh, educate the students to change or whether there's any, any other solutions for this one? Is that your question? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, yeah. thank, thank you very much. So this is to all the panelists, right? Okay, so so uh, three distinguished uh, panelists, uh, any of you would like to comment on this? Are we going through the same uh, the same order? <laughs> I, 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 I will start to you. <laughs> All right. It's more yeah. on free, free uh, style. I yeah, think yeah. We, uh, each of us will have some, some sort of different pieces to this, I guess. Okay, now, um, thank you for the question just now. It was a very good question. In fact, uh, you know, when when uh, Prof Ong earlier stated that the students, uh, they got a lot more of students' participation when they start running online. Maybe at, uh, I guess at this point in time, they were excited, you know, sort of going to a new platform. Uh, but of course, the question is how do we sustain it? Uh, you are right in the sense that uh, when we do, we continue to do this somewhere along the line, the student will start to miss the interaction that they have, the peer interaction, the interaction with the tutor uh, on, on <coughs> uh, in class, right? Kind of interaction, which actually, uh, I must say, it's quite enjoyable, right? Rather than just having a, a sitting in front of a computer and then everybody just focus on it and then um, and then and just do a virtual kind of interaction. But I think um, re remember in Prof Farhan point earlier. Now, the the development of the uh, the academic staff, right? In the sense that the ability to deliver. Uh, don't cut off their creativity. You see, always, I, I experienced as a, as, a, as a lecturer before, when you deliver the stuff, you always want to, want to do to the best your ability and to be able to sustain the student interest. Now, before this, we are face, uh, we are used to the face-to-face -face technique. So we do jokes, we do, you know, uh, we do many things that will keep the, the interaction lively. I think... Uh, you know, when we go on these online approaches, you can actually get them to follow the lecture, the face-to-face -face lecture, the so-called passive kind of, uh, of receiving on video, but you can actually conduct your class using this interaction platform such as Microsoft, um, such as this, this the platform that we are on, yeah, uh, uh, where you can actually interact with the students. Uh, of course, you can see the whole lot of them on the small screen, uh, but maybe you can be creative in actually try and 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 get them on board. Yeah, uh, to maybe you 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 could have more interaction with smaller classes, but you can be creative in trying to use the online platform to sort of do the facilitation of the learning. Don't do the lecture. <laughs> the lecture. Let, let the student just follow the video, but the facilitation, the interaction uh, is done through this uh, this online platform, such as the one that we are on here. I think I better uh, let my my other speakers to uh, sort of uh, give their point of view. Prof Ong and Prof Farhan, thank you. Yeah, Prof Ong and Prof uh, Farhan. Okay, so, um, so the question is that, um, how do we bring uh, bring students together? You know, in a physical space, face to face. So I think, uh, as we all know, that's not possible under the MCO. And so long as the campus is still not open, we are not allowed to do that. Uh, I know that students are not very happy about such things. But what we could do, I guess, is to encourage them to uh, do this kind of uh, online um, uh, uh, socializing through the different pedagogies, you know, how to group them, how to make them work in a group, um, like what we are doing now, you know, although I haven't met uh, Dr. Liu or Ms. Lim or my two fellow esteemed uh, panelist, but we are meeting now, you know, and uh, I am sure the kind of a friendship and bond um, 
maybe a bit different, different kind of experience. But I'm sure that when we get a chance to meet post COVID, the um, friendship immediately will be at a very different level from if we have not met at all. So I think to say that bonding and um, friendship is difficult uh, to form, um, yes, there is, you know, no two things are the same. We cannot compare apple and oranges. That's what I'm saying. So what students need to learn, perhaps, you know, is to how do we use the present experience and then moving forward, how do we enhance our future interactions using this experience that we have now? So, um, so this is one way to look at it. Uh, I know that your students are upset, not very happy because they miss their friends and all that. So I think it's the same with everybody else, you know. In fact, uh, my friends and I are arguing about whether this social distancing is leading towards uh, social uh, separation, you know, <laughs> and hopefully <laughs> it is just physical distancing and not social distancing, you know. <laughs> I mean, oh, of course, you know, we can have all sorts of term terminologies, you know, to describe our present situation, but use whatever that you feel comfortable. Um, so to answer the question of uh, Peck Fen, yeah, um, students will have no choice but to bear to 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 be to 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 use this period as a good experience to build up our patience uh, to be sabar uh, is very important right so i think i also learned a lot of things you know during this uh, covid mco period i thought that things i couldn't do you know i could do now you know i always thought that i must get out of home and go to office but i now do know that I can stay at home and still work and still getting connected with people. Of course, the little regret is always there that I can't see you face to face, you know. So I think we, we can encourage students to, you know, I mean, as lecturers, we can build in that kind of pedagogy into our classes and to make them meet uh, digitally first. And they will tell them, don't worry. The, 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 the uh, meeting in the physical space should be able to happen soon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank uh, you. Up. Yes. Yeah, just uh, I think this this is the the challenge for us uh, academics uh, in, in, in trying to get our students excited about online learning. Uh, and and it, it does dwindle. Uh, the excitement does dwindle. We, we are seeing that uh, uh, you know the the normal uh, attendance issues creeping back up you know from very good attendance to no reason for not attending overslap terlupa and whatnot you know this this have come back again uh, from our experience at USM but but I think it is up to us as an academic on how to engage better with the students. Uh, it, it, this is an opportunity. Of course, of course, if you have big class, it's it's an extra challenge. But if your class is in, in a manageable uh, num uh, size, this is a time that you can engage better with the students. And I think uh, how to do it is important. Uh, well, before that, the will is must be there. Your heart must be put there, put in place to to actually get the best out of this experience and and not uh, compromising on the learning experience and the learning outcomes of our students. I think that, that should be the motivation. Uh, then after, you need to know how to. And you can definitely go into the 108 videos of USM. I hope the secretary will share the link. Uh, or just go to CDAE USM. Uh, and you, will, you can pick and choose whatever title you want. Uh, all 51 hours of it, and, and it, it's time for you to acquire a new skill. Uh, I also sometimes try, you know, even, even meetings are non-stop uh, in, in, in my position, I'm sure my colleagues too, uh, but uh, wherever I can, I also want, want to learn uh, because there are so many new things to discover and to experiment. So I think this is the time, and how can you make your sessions very engaging? 
the, the latest one was just o- 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 over the weekend, how to create an attention grabber session. Wow, you know. I'm sure we, we have not able to do that within the two hours here, but uh, uh, people have skills and people have tools and people have experience on how to create that engaging learning experience for our students. What, what left to be a challenge is to, to also do psychomoto attributes. Like for me and Pro Ibrahim, who are engineers, we, we have that extra challenge. But uh, somehow we, we need that face-to-face for, to do that. But I think, it, I think people have, have actually uh, addressed it. There are success stories around it. So I think uh, this opens up to new opportunities. Share your experience, share your predicament with colleagues. Uh, have Zoom or have you know discussion uh, over online and 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 exchange. Uh, we are thinking of also having exchange uh, sessions like this uh, with regards to online assessment. Uh, so, so I think uh, we have done a lot of that and a lot of experience can be shared and we can learn from each other. And I hope uh, our session today has given enough motivation for all of you, for all of us to explore, discover and be a better academic uh, as a result of this uh, uh, experience. So that's my response to it. Don't give up uh, and tell us if your student has been turned around and actually enjoy online learning as much as, or almost as much as having face-to-face uh, interaction with their friends. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pham. Uh, okay, uh, I think due to time constraint, uh, we t- need to end these sessions uh, because uh, all our distinguished uh, speakers, I think they are very busy. I think Prof. Ong will need to attend another meeting later. So uh, let, let's uh, call it a day. To, uh, so thank you very much. And uh, thanks also to all the uh, participants for your participation. We hope that in the future, soon we will have an, some other webinars, uh, which will bring up more issues to discuss. Uh, again, thank, thanks again to all our panelists. Thank you very much. OK, thank all you. Right. Bye-bye. Stay safe thank and you, stay Thank healthy. you, Dr. Liu. Yeah, yeah, right. Thanks to everyone. Thanks, thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks. Bye.